We are here because we are dedicated to helping the entire CrossFit community. Determined to elevate coaches, box owners, athletes, and everything in between, we believe that this mission will begin right here, right now. While this time and this goal begins with you, our hope is that you take this fire ignited within you and weave it into your own life with the same unrelenting passion to give those you have the privilege of coming in contact with the best hour of their day. Welcome back to another episode. Fresh cup of coffee made, David. I appreciate you giving me that. The interview is substantially better when I'm caffeinated. So thank you for that. For the listeners, David Weck, most likely you're one of those people, it's like watching a movie and you're like, hey, uh, the same guys in a lot of great movies, but you don't know who it is. And I would say even CrossFitters, they've probably used your products over the years. So the, I would assume your claim to fame amongst many others. I'm sure you have some great things. I know you're a father and, you know, I, I know you're very fit. We were joking about that. Don't let the gray hair fool you if you're watching YouTube, but you you are the creator, inventor, founder, if you will, of the Bosu Ball. Yes, that that was the I guess what you call the big home run uh, that kicked off a career as an inventor. Yeah, and you know I'm I'm fascinated by entrepreneurs. A lot of the listeners are as well. I mean, if you own a CrossFit affiliate, you're an entrepreneur. Even those of you listening that are just I shouldn't say just that are coaches or trainers and do it on the side, a side hustle or anything like that. You're an entrepreneur. I've always said, you don't have to own something to be an entrepreneur. It's simply the idea that you're taking responsibility for your own life. Yeah, I would think? say so. Yeah. Well, I would say so. I think that that's a very good way to look at it. I think there's a risk and reward scenario and the entrepreneur is the individual who is willing to assume more risk. Uh, rather than the security, which I suppose could be a false security <laughs> these days, especially. But, um, you know, with the reward is a certain amount of autonomy and uh, self-direction and upside opportunity that is greater than if you choose the sort of, OK, I'm going to work for the man uh, type of career. Yeah, I usually tell people when they have decide this is the path they're going to take, the first feeling they should have is, how exciting. And the second feeling right away should be, oh shit. You need to have that yeah. good balance of both. Yeah. I, ha I have a younger brother who is extremely successful uh, with the digital space. He, he was, he caught the internet trend at the beginning, created a profitable uh, dot com right at the beginning. So it wasn't something that was an idea but it was a profitable venture. He was able to sell it to Netscape and then uh, AOL Netscape. doubled it. Yeah, and then and then AOL gobbled up Netscape. And so the deal went from here to here. And I said to him, I said, like, isn't it great being your own boss? And he's like, you don't understand. I work for my customers. So that means that, you know, I'm working 24 seven. I'm on call and I answer to, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people. <laughs> well, but that's why we tell affiliate owners. You don't have a boss. You have 100 bosses. Bingo, bingo. Yeah. Customer satisfaction is what keeps you going. Is, is it? Well, first of all, Netscape, for those listeners born after 1996, was, you know, in college. Did you go to school, David? I went to Williams College in Massachusetts. Oh, nice. I'm from the Northeast. So, yeah, I'm very familiar. And, you know, Internet Explorer and Netscape. Well, honestly, you probably didn't have the internet in college, if I'm being completely frank. I, I had an intranet in college. And What's that? It, that was like a network of college internet. So you didn't have any, you know, websites as we understand them now. But you were able to, I think by my junior, senior year, you were able to sort of submit papers to your professor through this intranet, not the internet. Yeah, we. I showed up at college at uh, SUNY Albany, Albany, New York, and... You know, you're given an email. You're not like, okay, I'm right. going to create something. It's like initials, last four of your social at albany.edu. And yeah, the internet back then was really just a handful of websites. And like you said, a, a small, small percentage of papers being due on the internet. But it wasn't until around, you know, graduating in 2000 that the internet took over. 
Are, are, are you sick of talking about the BOSU ball or can we t- chat? About no, it? no. I think, well, I think it's a logical thing to speak of because there is um, what I'll call a lot of misperception within uh, certain factions of the fitness industry about the BOSU ball. So uh, as successful as it is and with some seriously strong strength athletes and strength coaches who use it to, you know, to enhance their capacity and strength endeavors um, and power endeavors, it can be utilized in that way. But uh, because it's the also that, you know, 30 women in a room bouncing up and down uh, that sort of colored it in a, in a way that like, Oh, I want nothing to do with that because I would never be caught dead bouncing around in a room with 30 people. So, and then there was also the faction that sort of, made this um, scientific discovery that unstable surfaces make you weaker. So don't even look at a BOSU ball because it's, you know, it's a sham and it makes you weaker was sort of one of, it was branded as such. And because it's so popular, it became a punching bag for that um, sort of, sort of that conclusion or that determination that unstable equals weaker. And Yeah. So, so that's, so I'd love to clarify that because I have the utmost respect for CrossFit. When the BOSU ball was first invented, that's when CrossFit was coming on the scene. CrossFit was what, like eight, nine guys in a gym with classmen, you know, telling them climb the rope, you know, do do whatever. And the BOSU ball was just getting started as well. And CrossFit, CrossFit was the gut check to the entire industry to say, all right, First of all, what can you do? <laughs> yeah. Like, that will not measure what you can do. <laughs> it's interesting that the BOSU ball never really kind of made that leap into CrossFit. And I want to talk about that. But, you know, you, you brought up so much and you, you gave me a lot of questions. And one thing it reminded me of is I'm a huge Dave Matthews Band fan. Okay. I've been seeing them since, you know, 95, 96. But when you say that, it kind of reminded me like I'm going to dive bars in upstate New York seeing him with eight other people in the audience a year later, I'm going to SPAC or, or, you know, I would go to Massachusetts to Amherst. They play like UMass. And I'm like, man, this 40 year old woman's dancing next to me to, uh, you know, now to crash, you know, when I want to hear like the, you know, the, the ants marching and what would you say? Like the original song. So it kind of reminds me of that. And CrossFit kind of had that little bit of a, of a moment as well. Like, it's no longer that punk band in 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 the in a dive bar. Now I got to pay premium and I got to deal with someone that heard one hit song on the radio. Mm. So I, I can understand that. But let me ask you this question as an entrepreneur. And let me make sure I word this right. Do you care what people are saying about the BOSU ball when the checks are coming in? Yes, I do. I care. I, I'm a guy. I'm a kid from Jersey and. Oh, where are you from I, in Jersey? Madison, New Jersey. All right. Um, my baby's and, name, Madison, yeah. Oh, cool. Well, it, Madison, New Jersey was sort of, when I was coming up, it was really known as a tough, principally Italian town. So you still had the grandmothers making their own tomato sauce with the tomatoes that they grew in the backyard. And well, I hear the accent now. There, there it is. Yeah, well, yeah, and I, and I, I sort of had a... a, a a circuitous upbringing where I lived in Africa and Yugoslavia and Iran as a youngster. So I think that sort of twisted my tongue a little bit. So, you know, my accent's a little bit different, but there is definitely Jersey in it. Um, So I, um, I care about integrity first and foremost. So if you don't have integrity, well, then I just don't want to have anything to do with you. And I will never compromise my integrity. Because I view, I view that as that's a very short term perspective. You, you, it'll catch up to you eventually. And when you meet your maker, what'd you do? Right. Did, did you sell out? Did you, you know, did you maintain integrity? And the BOSU ball is just a tool. OK, so you can use a hammer to pound a screw into the wall and you can use a hammer to pound a nail into the wall. And, you know, you could argue that the second way is a better way to use that tool. And the BOSU ball is it's a very, when the dome side is up, it is a very unique balance of stable and unstable. 
So the device itself is 100% stable, but it has this inflatable dome that will sort of undulate and move slightly under your feet that creates that instability. But it's an elastic. And with elastics, we have this unique quality. The training stimulus from elastics is a force acceleration multiplier. So if you think of a slingshot where you're stretching an elastic, a BOSU ball is just the converse where you're compressing the elastic, but a slingshot with a hundred pounds of tension force on the stone that you're going to project at the ground versus that hundred pound weight, the mass moves at 9.8 meters per second squared acceleration. The slingshot moves at some factor X that is exponentially faster for the same force registration. OK, and what that does to the nervous system, especially when you take elastics to the limit force so that it's all you can muster, is now you're getting this almost like a current stimulating the nervous system to to produce that amount of force. And it leads to sort of a recruitment of of, of the fast twitch fibers where you can use elastics to prime yourself to do better with the mass. So if you do an inc incredible elastic tension for like a one, two, two, drop it. Now, when you go to hit the bar, it's like, oh, I'm charged and I'm not exhausted in any way, shape or form. And so with the BOSU ball, what we do with the BOSU ball primarily for strength enhancement to enhance the lifts with mass and to charge the nervous system to be faster as a runner, as a jumper, as an athlete, is we compress the BOSU ball. And it's why I created the BOSU Elite, which has a very high tension dome where the people like a Donnie Thompson, the people like a Marty Gallagher, who he, they call him the Iron Monk. He's just a, a strength coach that has a storied past that most people have never heard of. But the world record performances under his stewardship speak volumes. So when you compress this BOSU ball and you give it all that you have, it's fighting back against you faster than what something else will. And it's a center line strength. So the compression goes to a center line, which has all sorts of positive benefits for the application to sport, but it also creates a unique capacity to recruit, to create this sort of wave of center line to express outward. And so well, if, if you think of breaking the bar type of a thing. It's sort of that similar dynamic where it's coming from the outside strong to the inside long expressed through the hands and expressed through the feet. Yeah. I mean, in CrossFit, we talk about midline stabilization. Yes. Right? Yes. Correct. And, and midline, think, yes. Yes, exactly. And it's a unique way to take the extremities and relate them to the midline that produces an advantage when you're in that linear straight encounter with the ground or with a bar. And, and I used to use it myself. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in Globo gyms or standard box gyms. Right. And, and they always existed there. In fact, I was at a gold gym and we'd have, you know, storage of multiple BOSU balls over in the corner. We would use them for, you know, it, it's great in that aerobic sense because yeah, you have some tremendous lifters on your site. If people, you know, haven't gone to your site, weckmethod.com, W-E-C-K. But, you know, you would do your bench press on there or you would, you know, do your abs on there. And it's challenging because you do have to balance and you have to, you know, develop that core strength in order to use it. And then it makes everything else challenging as well because of that. Where, where did the initial idea come from? Uh, so basically the backstory on the BOSU ball was I was pursuing acting in New York City, which meant I was a personal trainer for most of my income. OK, <laughs> yeah. and I discovered rollerblading in Manhattan, which the whole thing is paid. You're dating right? yourself again. You're dating yourself. Oh, yeah. it, well, rollerblades used to be cool back in the early 90s. OK, and now they're not. I get it. <laughs> but th what they are is they represent this effortless power. So you just skate along the island of Manhattan, a little 98% of it is paved. So the whole thing is a roller rink and the efficiency with which I could get around town, I could beat a cab across town. And if I was going up or downtown, I could hang on to a cab and then pull away at the end. 
So you would do like the Back to the Future, the Marty McFly. I did such crazy stuff. I was jumping eight feet in the air over people, going down staircases, hanging on to cars. I mean, I got hooked on the back of a Range Rover once and the thing pulled up to about 55, 60 miles an hour. And that's a speed where you cannot let go. And <laughs> and you pray and you can't see either because your eyes are just pure water. And you pray that your bearings aren't going to seize up <laughs> or, or hit a hole. Right. So I, you know, I, I lived that young, crazy life in Manhattan. But the point is, is that I rollerbladed with an extreme uh, intensity that I didn't walk or run for six years. So I was always in skates because it was, and I hated walking. It took so long to get from here to there. So I skated everywhere and my feet became so weak that literally I was on a rocky beach in France and I had to crawl off on my hands and knees because my feet couldn't handle. I went to a community, a community swimming pool and I couldn't walk from the kiddie pool to the diving boards on the cement because my feet cramped up and were hurting so bad. And then one day I dropped the motorcycle, wrenched it up real fast. And I felt my back, like my lower back get twinged a little bit. And three days later, it just doom seized on me and I was white hot pain. And then because my feet were weak, my upper body was not, did not have the capacity to send the force clean to the ground. So there was always this sort of inherent compensation and protection that couldn't resolve itself. And back then I didn't know any of this stuff. So it led to a year in chronic pain. And when I discovered the stability ball, it was like, oh, that sort of reflexive writing and adjusting that was useful to sort of hit a reset as it were. But then I started standing on the thing and that again, centerline strength, the feet getting that, you know, sort of articulation manipulation, my back started to feel better and better but the risk and reward ratio is skewed to, you know, high risk. And I started falling off the ball and I had studied Feldenkrais by that point. So I was going into this minimalist. So not only was I jumping onto the ball and jumping from one to another, because I enjoy that kind of thing, but I was also doing the minimalist stuff where I would close my eyes, be really soft, tilt my head back. And one night I fell off a 75 centimeter big ball, bounced on it, did a backflip. The first thing I did was kick my feet to make sure I could still do that. <laughs> and that night, that night, it's sort of, you know, flash of inspiration. What if I cut the ball in half and a nanosecond later, I was like, holy shit, what if I cut the ball? And I've not seen that. Oh, my gosh. Think of all the things that will be useful because you've now suddenly rearranged the risk reward ratio of that inflatable dome. And if, if the Bozu ball were only platform side up, it would have just degenerated into another wobble board that you see at the therapy office. And OK, you, you know, it would have a fraction of the utility that it does with the dome side up. Now, that's not to say that there's application on the platform that can be useful, but what makes it special is when the dome side is up. And it's in effect the trampoline that has a reverse relationship with the center line. The trampoline, you go down and depress it so that it's directing you to the center and sort of, you know, ch changing the feet to create a different dynamic where the Bosu ball has the top is the highest point which creates your capacity now to drive to center line. And it, it's, it just happens to be very, very conducive to high transfer to better ground-based mechanics. And you don't even have to know what you're doing to get the effect. The stimulus is inherent in it. And it's, and this is all the stuff that does, it's not sexy. So you would, it wasn't used to market it like, Hey, I remember showing it to a sports agent friend of mine. His wife came down to the basement where we were to do the laundry. And I said, you know, she's like, oh, okay, what's your new invention do? It was still a prototype. And I was like, well, it makes you balance so much better. And she's like, balance? I care about my butt. I don't care about my balance. So, you know, to balance of like, oh, okay, it's not a very sexy topic. And the only people engaged in it are the people who, you know, twisted your ankle bad enough that you have to go to the therapist. Yeah. Right? So all of this functional benefit wasn't sexy enough to put on the front burner, you know, to, to say, OK, well, here are benefits. So it's, you know, it's for the geeks to understand. 
and the trainers like myself you yeah, no, exactly yeah. exactly but but even when i first not that i'm in, not a geek yeah i get you i think you're probably a geek i mean you know it, you there's a certain depth of knowledge that you possess about physiology biomechanics the kin kinesiology that is way deeper than your buddies from college right yeah yeah okay. for sure yeah for fair sure. I, I was i'm the one that stuck around as a personal trainer like you while they went all went off for six figure yeah. jobs in Manhattan. Exactly. Yeah. Correct. Oh, you're a personal trainer. <laughs> yeah. I, right, just, right. I just spoke about that. I was embarrassed. You know, my mom still doesn't think I have a job. Yeah. There but, you, go. Uh, you know, like you, what's better than doing what you love your entire life. It, time is the most precious commodity, right? You don't want to look back on it and say, Hey, what did I do? Right. Exactly. So, so let, let me follow yeah. up with a couple of questions and you're, I, yep. I love everything you're saying you've kind of explained the why behind it and why you created it. I think the challenge, maybe it wasn't a challenge like Kleenex, right? You understand the term Kleenex represents all tissues in the world. Facial tissue. Yes. Facial tissues, right. Or scotch tape and, you know, many Coca-Cola Velcro Velcro is a great one. The Bosu ball has kind of become that for all Balls, really. And that, that my listeners will laugh at that. I didn't mean it as a joke. <laughs> Blue balls. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, but or stability balls, I should say. Has that been a challenge for you? Because you are the one with the platform. I assume it's like proprietary, it's you know, patented, etc. But whenever someone sees a, a big ball at a gym, they refer to it as a BOSU ball. What I would say is that um it created its own unique care, uh, category, as in half balls. They didn't exist prior to it because it's really hard to build, by the way. I mean, you know, nature, oh, yeah, it nature doesn't nature doesn't like it, a bubble is round. It's not a half. <laughs> so yeah. the, for, the forces acting on that platform are exponentially higher than anyone would even imagine because it has to maintain its integrity and shape under a pressure. But um, which means you, it costs some money to make it, which ha that's been helpful in um, sort of staving off the knockoffs because you can't just bend some metal and, you know, make it super cheap. Uh, you can make it cheaper and it doesn't perform as well. But so we created our own category. There's a, by now there's a lot of knockoffs, but basically the rule in innovation when you're inventing products is if you're not being knocked off, well, you don't have anything, Right. So if it is something, it will be knocked off. And it is, if it is not successful, then it won't. And so you, it's, it's sort of just, you know, the heads to the tails, the tails to the heads. It's two sides of the same coin. And what I would say is that they're amongst the exercise community that they, they would call any half ball a BOSU ball. And some of them might refer to a ball as a BOSU ball. But amongst you, you go to the Nebraska County Fair and you say BOSU ball, they're going to give you a blank stare because they don't know that. And then if you say blue half ball, they're going to say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I know that thing. I seen that. I used it in therapy. Oh, yeah, my trainer has me do right. That type right. of exactly. Thing. So I didn't do the best job in branding the name BOSU in the beginning, which, you know, it, it, there's some good in that and there's some bad in that. But Where did the name Bosu come from? It came from both sides up. And then, uh, and then what I did was personally, oh, I, I shifted the meaning of the acronym to both sides utilized as, as a training philosophy. So both sides up, you know, I guess it could represent optimism, like glass half full, both sides up. Yeah, but like but, but it, it, it also describes the, the physical device itself. Like you can put it this way or you can put it that way. And both sides utilized, however, that is really Taoism sort of captured in an American phrase where it's like both sides utilized. I want, you know, the right and the left hemispheres of the brain. I, I want the, you know, the upper and the lower, the fast, the slow, the, you know, the, the super, super powerful and the super, super soft. And when you understand and master polarities, you just basically increase the bandwidth in between. So, 
the and then the Navy SEALs they'll say slow is smooth, smooth is it fast. Is fast. Yeah. Right. So if you so if you do the weapons training very slowly, deliberately, and smooth, never never hastily rushing. Right. No. 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 Eventually, you get so fast because now it's the second nature. Right. Whereas if you didn't master that slow, smooth polarity. Well, then you'd be fumbling in the moment when it counts. And OK, now you're not even fast. So that and, and then with exercise, if you really want to understand something, you, you have to ha have an appreciation for the gradations of force involved. And so if you're going in a max effort lift, there may be certain inefficiencies that just your nervous system cannot even sense. So that's not the time to sort of. That is the time to just go and, you know, I'm not, you know, not trying even to pay attention to it because I wouldn't feel it. And if you were lifting a bar and, and a fly landed on it, your nervous system would detect no differential. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's a lot of weight plates that aren't made by Rogue where, you know, you've got a 43 and a half and a 47 on opposite sides because, you know, you bought them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Rogue, Rogue, you like you said, that's good. That's great that, you know, Rogue. Um, we judged last year during the pandemic. And because of that, because we were all going to different places to judge the top athletes, we actually had to weigh their weights. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, not yeah. everybody had new rogue competition plates and yeah, you'd be well, surprised. If, if, let's, so let's say for example, that on the right side of the bar, you have 44 and a half. And on the left side of the bar, you have 45s. Okay. Well, you might not be able to even feel that half a pound differential. I mean, you know, try it someday, you know, sneak a little quarter pounder <laughs> on, on one side of the bar and see if your buddy understands that, like, if, if he even says anything, right? Yeah, it, it's, it's truly, you know, and, and, and that's some of the things that as I think in the CrossFit space where there has been, you know, I would say plateaus, it's things like that, like old school for the listeners. Chuck Carswell once did what was referred to as an uneven grace. So grace in our world is 135 uh, clean and jerk uh, ground to overhead. And he did it with an uneven bar, mm. right? Meaning, you know, it's still 135, you know, but maybe 55 on one side, 35 on the other. Things like that. Things like the BOSU ball. Like we forget it's, yes. it's the non-sexy well, stuff. Well, and, and what that would represent is that would represent a differential where you're getting a push-pull phenomenon. So you're going to be pushing the heavy side and pulling, to a certain extent, the light side, because otherwise it's going to tip over. So that would be a strategy to say, OK, I'm going to learn to handle that. So I create sort of a, I'm, I'm rounding out or increasing the bandwidth of my capacity to deal yeah. with imbalance. And then when you get on the bar and it's just those micro millimeters that count, perhaps your body has now greater capacity to sort of range that. And so that you don't fail, even if it's not the most precise, uh, you know, sort of lift that you've ever done. And, and it's funny because CrossFitters notoriously, if you go to a box and they have a handful of different companies plates, some rogue, some high, you know, high temp, whatever, they'll seek out matching plates, right? Oh yeah. And it's absolutely. like insignificant at the end of the day, because you don't know just because they both say rogue that they weigh the same thing, especially high temps, a chip and et cetera. Yeah. But, you know, are, are you growing up in the same generation I did working out Plates in or plates out when you put them oh, on a box. plates in. It was a cardinal sin where I <laughs> lifted that, you know, you didn't know what you were doing. And they were York barbells. They were metal. And it was in the YMCA. I yeah, mean, yeah, like, yeah. You know, and yeah, then you got to keep the power in. Power stays in when you put them on the right way. Well, it's I guess, you know, they almost sort of line up better when you're clanking. Because when I used to squat, I had I had an ego when I squatted and that meant that I literally could not do a light day squatting. Oh, yeah. So, and I so that know. meant that at a minimum, it was four plates on both sides or, uh, you know, four plates. Yeah. Plus plus fractional weight on top of that. And the, the whole idea is when you took it out of the rack, you gave it just a bounce, right? <laughs> to, make it, to make it clank, not to yeah. upset the, you know, the alignment. But, you know, you wanted that bar to bend a little bit. <laughs> and 
like if I didn't get to that every single workout, well, then like I would I would have felt ashamed. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, and I think the, the true reason is the old school metal plates have that ridge. On yes, the yes, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. So you grab them that way Correct. in order to take them off. And, and yes. like yes. most people, once in a while, there'll be a two and a half on there that you forgot about mm-hmm. that will that will land on your foot. Um, oh, so, God. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> I think something in common with the BOSU ball and CrossFit is dumb people have given both a bad reputation. You know, oh something my you alluded God. to I early. Mean, like you go on yes. YouTube and everyone thinks CrossFit's dangerous and you oh. know, I'm gonna have to do these cheating pull-ups, et cetera, and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, that's true. Dumb people do that every day. The better boxes, the better coaches don't allow it and they teach right. you how to do it right. Correct. What impact Correct. have dumb people like do you get like, do you cringe when you'll see like a viral video of somebody squatting 315 on a, on, you know, jumping, doing crazy, like the milk crate um, challenge? I, I don't, cr- I don't cringe so much as I, I just sort of shake my head in disgust. And I used to clench my teeth when I would see someone bashing the BOSU ball, perhaps you citing that, you know, silly, whatever thing as, as a, you know, as a rationale for their bashing it. But it, it would infuriate me to the point where I was acting quite like an asshole for a few years, um, you know, battling against this injustice um, where, you know, now I just take a different tack. Um, but it it would infuriate me when someone would say Bosu balls make you weaker um, because that's that is like the song and dance of a certain set faction in the industry who would also tend to say that CrossFit is dangerous because, you know, CrossFit sued the NSCA and they won the suit. Yeah. And and that that was was like, that was a landmark. That was a landmark sort of thing. Most lawsuits do not go to judgment. They, They always settle. Right. But that's one that was knocked down, drag it out. Greg Glassman was like, uh, uh, no, you're not going to do this. Right. And we have the fabricated, you know, emails. They deleted emails. The judge in the case said this was the biggest case of malicious malfeasance that I've ever witnessed in my judicial career. It's amazing how much you know about this. It's impressive. Well, listen, I'm a student. I'm an historian of the fitness sports training industry. And I've lived off a royalty for 20 years. And, you know, I've got a curious mind. So I've devoted more time to the analysis of video, um, to the research, you know, 80 pages into forums um, and my own personal exploration and process to get to the root of fight and flight. So I view those as that's the foundation is fight and flight. And everything stems from that because ultimately survival is what it is about, right? Darwinian fitness to pass on your genes, right? I mean, you don't want to win the Darwin award by dropping the weight on your head and, you know, (laughs) not procreating. (laughs) And humans have the unique capacity to, as it were, procreate through ideas and concepts where, you know, Isaac Newton can live on even if he didn't have kids, right? So (laughs) you pass on information. Let me, let me ask you this and, and feel free to skirt the issue as much as you want. As another person that's been involved in the fitness industry, tremendous success, et cetera. From an outside perspective, what did you think when everything happened with Greg Glassman uh, a year and a half ago? I, I mean, it was sort of the tipping, tipping your toes into the wokeism that now has run rampant. And I would say that Glassman is smarter than your average bear. So when he, you know, puts forth what he would interpret as humor, humor, other people not on that same intellectual scale could interpret it as, you know, callous racism. But I think if you were going to measure racists in the world, I don't think Greg Glassman is even, you know, on that scale of being racist. Yeah, I think a it was on the screen. I agree. They're correct. And so I think it was a very unfortunate, you know, means by which to, you know, to stab Caesar and enjoy the process and, you know, OK, you know, take it out on him. You know, he's an asshole, blah, blah, blah. And that may be so in certain aspects. I mean, the guy 
independent wealth means you answer to no one. And so he could be an asshole to people if he chose to be. And there's no consequence. You know, you tell him to jump. Well, he says no. <laughs> Just, you yeah. know, doesn't have an overlord. But I think, again, now we are living in the surreal, illogical realm of we're about to be usurped by a communist undertaking with an illogic that is disgusting and infuriating and hopefully civil war before that happens. OK, so I have absolutely no patience for this. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, the administration and the powers that be social media, you know, big pharma. It, it's all this conspiring into this illogic that is horrible for humanity and I would tend to think that the CrossFit community would tend to be on that side of like, oh, you know, I'm going to live by logic and it's, you know, I'm going to be free or die type of mentality. Mm -hmm. And that's the backbone. That's the spine of our country. I mean, guys have to drive trucks and pick shit off forklifts for the rich people to, you know, to have their caviar. Right. So the whole thing grinds to a halt if the guy who can, you know, do the real work can't can't work. Right. So that to me, it was it was sort of that initial dive into this wokeism where we're going to fry people and ruin people because, you know, whatever the reasons may be. But, it, it, you know, that that's my interpretation of what happened in that case. Yeah, it's too bad my partner's not on. I think you guys would be best friends. Um, but we, I firmly agree with you on that. And, and I especially on the Coach Glassman thing. I think, like you said, I never interpreted his tweet as racist. I interpreted it as him truly sticking up for the affiliates. And it was a shame to me and something I continue to, to push that, you know, all the affiliates that were jumping ship were just sheep versus. Well, I like think so. So now look at it from that affiliate who jumped ship. What they're concerned about is in their market, perhaps they have, you know, clientele who's pulling up in a BMW and, you know, might vote blue, not red or whatever. Right. So that, you know, any impropriety in this social sort of, uh, you know, good behavior, maybe it would have compromised their business. Right. Yeah. And I think something you kind of alluded to, you might not have said it like, and I think you're a perfect candidate for this and please don't take offense. The most successful people are a little freaking crazy. And oh, listen, listen, I, 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 I wear that as a, you know, I don't run from that. I've lost my mind four times. Okay. So what happened to me, what happened to me was I, I was a East coast, New Jersey, get up early, work hard. And during my little slice of, you know, the junior high, high school experience, pot made you a loser. It made you apathetic. You were a burnout, a druggie if you did pot. So I crushed alcohol. All right. We killed a lot of troops every weekend since the age of 13 to 30. What's the go to? Know. What's the go to in the 90s or 80s? Is well, a uh, well, I mean, it was all the way from, you know, a keg without ice of Milwaukee Beast. Oh, you got to get parties, the beast. Yeah. Right? Or or I'd have a 12 pack of Beck's Dark before going out and drinking the beast. Right. Any so Zima? any Zima in there. Um, no, that was sort of before my time uh, or after my time. Yeah, that, OK, because that was my go to. And, and, yeah, you know. that was that was after after me. But, you know, if you're splurging, you're getting St. Paulie's girl or, you know, you're, you're having, a, you know, good, you know, good beer. And then I love red wine. I loved it. I don't drink anymore. Not a drop. But and I loved whiskey and like I loved alcohol and six drinks a day for me was you know, I'm, there's not even a buzz at, at six drinks. You know, it was just my body had acclimated to it, but then it, it beat me up too bad. So I, I stopped um, and I don't even miss it that much. I mean, maybe the red wine and a, a whiskey with a cigar, but I, I don't smoke cigars either. So and once you you either smoke them or you don't, you know, to, to enjoy them, you got to smoke them. A once in a while is not as enjoyable if you're not acclimated. But anyway, when I came to California, it, all of a sudden, it's like you meet a lawyer and you're like, you're successful. You smoke pot every night. What? It, so it hey, gave I me light. In, I live in Colorado, David. Yeah, there you go. I mean, you got that high altitude purple sky. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you, we got some good stuff out here. Yes, yeah, of yes. course. 
So when what happened with me was it sort of gave me license to now, all right, well, let me try this stuff out. And what it did for, I think it's different for everybody, but what it did for me, it was like a stimulant, like you wouldn't believe. So the stronger stuff that would knock another person out was just more like, like literally an amphetamine or something for me. And it gave me sensitivity where I could feel the slightest little nuance in terms of, you know, the, the forces acting upon my body. And then because I care about the martial art, I use that to, to train with sticks and ropes and organize my body so that I had mapped the universe within and I had mapped the cardinal directions without. And then I played this game called Push Hands, a variation of it, which oh, I yeah, sort I've of- seen, Yeah, I've seen that. On, well, yeah. so, so I played not, I didn't play whole, you know, the Chinese master push hands where you're essentially, you know, I played a push hands version where it is as competitive as you can possibly be. You're not striking and you're not grabbing and wrestling so that you create no damage, but you know in no uncertain terms who is the better man in terms of you cannot move me. And the way that you cannot be moved when you're smaller, weaker, and slower like me genetically is you learn how to yield. So you learn how to be invisible against the force. So someone much bigger than me starts to try to push me. I engage them. I find their center and then I redirect their push off my center. So now they're pushing on nothing, but they think they're pushing on something. And now you capture their center and you just change faster than they can because you played the game. And I will literally take a 240 pound monster who doesn't know this game and I will embarrass him, <laughs> okay? Embarrass his ass because I'm playing a game. And, and then I develop striking ability where I, I know with pinpoint precision how to daffy duck someone's jaw, okay? And I've spent literally hundreds of thousands of times boning up these knuckles. And I even created my own variation of the arrangement of the hand to throw up more powerful, safer punch than what is conventionally done. It's called the core fist. And it came through the study of fight and flight because I always looked at it as when I was, when I was coming up in high school, it was a bully culture, all right? The seniors would literally piss on the sophomore, urinate on the sophomores in the shower, all right? <laughs> yeah. I'm talking urinating on them, okay? And no one ever urinated on me because I exuded something where if you're going to do that, I will fucking bite your fucking nose off. Yeah. Right. Like, I don't care. I'm not fighting fair. You're not going to urinate on me. Right. So I always had a don't tread on me mentality and I'm not big. I'm not strong and I'm not fast by, you know, competitive measures. I played division three football because there is no division four. OK, so <laughs> so what what I developed was I developed that ability that in the fisticuffs, in the stand-up game, I can take care of myself. I'm not afraid and I don't fear other men. And anyone who I would fear, I would say I have at least one move to defend myself and maintain my center and then run away. Now, if you kick me, I will cry. And if you pick me up and throw me down, I'm probably going to lose pretty quick. But if it's a stand-up, then again, I have trained this with an intensity of a royalty income and as much as $3,000 a week of weed, okay? So <laughs> it cost me my marriage, but at the time it was, oh, well, that's just more time for this training. <laughs> so I love it. it was, you know, I have an intensity that makes me, yeah, I'm bipolar. And what I would say is that from just my own diagnosis of looking at it, I'm an altruistic narcissist. So Altruism and narcissism are two polarities. And I want to be great. I want to be so great, but it's for the right reasons. I want to contribute to humanity and make the world better. I don't want to shit on other people. I don't want to become some kind of powerful you know, force at the expense of integrity. I believe that physical education is the foundation of all education. And it's also the one realm where you are accountable. And again, hats off to CrossFit for taking the fitness industry and saying, guys, stop pretending. Firefighters need to actually be able to carry the person up and down the stairs. OK, so we're going to stop pretending and we're going to start measuring what you can actually do. 
And that was a breath of fresh air where sort of this globo physique, you know, pose and pretend, you know, okay, you know, how many can you actually do? Well, you know, today's not my day, <laughs> you know, that type of mentality. I love it. And, you you know, you are so similar to Coach Glassman in that. And I think, like I said, and, and, and uh, you know, myself included, like being an entrepreneur, I mean, for those listening, every time you hear that noise, that's David's email going off. Yeah, yeah sorry. You know, it, no, it's all I, yeah, good, but it's like, sorry. you know, I'm a huge UFC fan. And one of the first seasons of The Ultimate Fighter, Dana White says, so you want to be a fucking fighter. And it's the same um, idea when it comes to entrepreneurs. I'm always like, so you want to be an entrepreneur, right? Like you think you do. You think you want to step into the cage. You think you want to step into the arena, you know, as uh, Theodore Roosevelt or Brene Brown would talk about. Make sure yeah. you want to. And it takes a little bit of crazy to to be able to do that, to have the days where you're working 5 a.m. To, to midnight and to have the days where you're just off you know, rollerblading on the back of a Lexus, right? You have well, all of I, these. I, I think what, what happened, it was a Range Rover, but um, a Range Rover. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the car exactly because that was almost the day I lost my life. But uh, <laughs> I would say that that entrepreneurial spirit means that you're, you're essentially willing to do whatever it takes and subjugate, you know, uh, pleasure now for success ongoing. And, so it means that if you have to stay up all night because it's raining and you just discovered that your building has leaks and you just installed the floor and if it rains and it gets wet, well, that's going to cost me $20,000 and shutting down the place for three days. So what do you have to do? You have to get the buckets, get on the roof, put up this plastic, mop it up as it's coming down. How, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's what it oh, takes. Yeah. That's what it takes to, to really be successful. And if you're willing to do that, then the rewards can be great. And when I was spending all that time rollerblading, that was when I was an actor and a personal trainer, which is entrepreneurial in a sense, but it, I was able to carve out hours in the middle of the day when I wasn't training anyone and I didn't have an audition where I was able to just, you know, free form it, not work, right? And then it was incredible amounts of work for the BOSU ball sacrificing health and well-being to do it. I mean, literally. And because there's do or die moments where, you know, it, I always use the analogy that if 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 the bus leaves at 11 a.m. and you get there at 1101, well, now you're walking. <laughs> but if you get there at 11 or 1059, well, now you're riding the bus. Right. And so you're making progress because you achieved a certain objective that come hell or high water, you had to get there to catch the bus. If you miss the bus, you're totally screwed. I could talk about this entrepreneurial stuff all day and I, and I would love to have you back on to do that. But before we wrap up, I, I do want to ask you about another invention you had. This is actually yeah. what, you know, triggered me to read. I've reached out to David Newman, who is also an inventor. Yes, um, yes. And he's also a little crazy like us. Um, mm -hmm. I think you might be the top of the list, but we're, we're, you know, fast approaching. And, <laughs> <laughs> but the soul step. Oh yeah. I, yeah. I was fascinated by that because if, if you can't tell I, I'm at my desk, but I stand all day. Yes. And I was like, Oh man, those look really interesting. Tell me a little bit more about that because you know, we have a lot of listeners that maybe they've worked full time before they coach or their members. Yes. And yes. I always tell people, you know, try to get yourself a stand-up desk. Mine goes up and down. I never sit. I don't have a chair in here. Um, my 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 pup Rocky on the floor over there hates it because he wants to be on my lap. Yep, yep. But but tell me about the soul step and how that came about. Okay, so um, the soul step was a work in development for uh, probably a dozen years, and it it began with the concept of the name a weck deck because it rhymes. So in around 2008 ish, I started ideating on this concept of a WEC deck and it. And so I was doing a lot of experimentation on like, OK, what surface can I provide that's going to educate my body to 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 use the skeleton more efficiently to reduce the muscular effort to to stand, for example. Um, and with the BOSU ball. 
there, depending upon how you position your feet will fundamentally change the force vectors. And there is a particular spot on the BOSU ball that I discovered in probably 2010, 11, 12 ish, where it's remarkably similar in nature to what the soul step is. And the soul step is something that is just very special. And I'll give you sort of a, a, a sort of the fork of how I developed it. So like I mentioned, I lost my mind four times and marijuana led to psychosis and it led to me connecting with the unseen, the, the sort of you know, other realms, you know, the infinite, infinite, the timeless time. And my brain would go there and then it would get so just overwhelmed that I would black out. And it would, it, these are these manic episodes that would lead to, you know, running down the street naked and five cops with tasers, you know, pointing at me. <laughs> and then I'm handcuffed in the back of a police car and I know what the officer is going to say before he says it. And then he says it. And I'm not saying that that even happened, but I'm saying that that was my perception. <laughs> OK, sort of this Nietzschean super ability, but, you know, not functional in this realm was where I went to. And so mathematics has always fascinated me because mathematics is sort of the language of truth, you know, certainty. Yeah. Yeah. But there are conundrums in mathematics like pi and phi and these irrational numbers that never repeat. So they go on forever and ever. And there's no site, there's no cyclical aspect. They're not the, you know, the, 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 they're not the hard and fast numbers where we can be certain that two plus two is four. And and it's all proportions and ratios and complexity. And I looked at, so, and I'm taking you on the sort of the esoteric route to how I arrived at Soul Steps because it was the esoteric route that actually led to it. But then there was the Western anatomical aspect that also led to it. So the night that I conceived of it as what it is today was I said, okay, when we divide a circle, we have 360 degrees. The first division is 180. The second division is 90. The third division is 45. The fourth division is 22.5. And the fifth division is 11.25. And I said, all right, we're going to take the fifth division and that's the slope. And then we're going to rotate that slope by the fourth division. And we create a complex combination of 11.25 and 22.5. And we arrive at a surface that creates this loading X so that from the inside ball of your foot, the big toe, that is the highest position that you experience. And it goes 22.5 degrees to the lowest position, which is the outside of the heel. So you have essentially eliminated that pronating collapse because of that directional vector. So the highest position is the inside ball of the foot slash big toe. The lowest position is the outside heel so that we have that directional shifting of weight as you're standing on it. Now, the other X is from the inside heel to the outside ball of the foot because the inside heel is higher than the outside ball of the foot. So you're getting that projection to the fourth and fifth metatarsals, which is the initiation point for that athletic sprinting. So if you're sprinting or running, the, the most efficient way for most people based on the generalized anatomy is that the fourth, the heads of the fourth and fifth metatarsals will initiate the ground contact. And then the spiral dynamic of going from that supination to the pronation and toe off of the inside is, is sort of, that's, that's arguably the best generalized mechanics. OK, and the soul step gives you this gravity's happening now. Like so you're standing there, you're still accelerating and that elicits that extension reflex and, you know, the animation of being alive and blah, blah, blah. So standing still is a dynamic act in terms of the force vectors happening. I mean, if, and if you measured with precise lasers, everybody's got a degree of sway. So you're never standing perfectly still ever, ever. And so what happens on that soul step is it, it teaches you how to pitch your weight forward and take weight out of the calcaneus while sort of spring loading the foot in this, I can't collapse in a pronate and I don't have to use 
the small flexors of the toes. So if you think about forward locomotion, if the toes grab at the ground and you're using those little tiny muscles that flex the toes, you prevent the extension of the foot itself and the toes are now in a losing battle because your body weight's gonna overcome them and then the result can be this plantar fasciitis and then the shin splint because physiologically, if your body senses any imbalance at all, it's gonna wanna grab with the toes. So the soul steps gives you this patterning to experience a dynamic force transmission through your feet in a standing position when they're uphill that teaches you to neurologically just turn off the toes, bro, relax. You don't need them. You don't need them. And to not be so anchored and rooted in your heels that you're stuck in your heels where there is absolutely no given play. So if you're stuck in your heels, well, any imbalance in the skeleton at all is going to be manifest by some compensatory action of the soft tissue above because there's no give whatsoever. So when you can, those micro millimeters that matter a lot, when you're dropping a drop of water on the system over and over and over, <laughs> right? Those matter. And so by doing that inherently, you literally become more informed and educated to, to tip the balance of your myofascial nervous system control to, to support, suspend, and transport the skeletal structure, that inner architecture, more efficiently. And they work great in training too, in the gym. And you can use them downhill. They're like Olympic lifting shoes that, again, gives you that lateralization to the outside ball of the foot. And they're, they're just... And so, and so if you look at the foot, now let's talk Western anatomy a little bit. The, the, the base of the foot is the calcaneus that routes directly to the fourth and fifth toes. And then the sitting on top of that, literally on top, is the talus, which has direct tie into the big toe, second toe, and third toe. So you can think of your foot as, as these dual structures. One is lower and outside, and one is higher and inside. And you have to use the whole foot to be efficient. So it is the sequential, the kinematics of how you load it and, and the subtlety of doing a snatch, of doing a squat. It's not a constant constant. There is a dynamic that's happening, even if it's not visual from the sight of the eyes. There is a shift. There is a differential. There is a tensional balance that can be improved upon. And the soul steps you just have to stand on them to experience it. Dave Newman came into my office. We were talking. He's like, "What? Is, let me feel the soul steps. And he stood on the soul step and he's like, holy cow, this is incredible. And he's like, I want to buy five of them for my office. And we're like, Dave, Dave, no, we're going to give them to you. He's like, no, I insist. I'm going to buy them, right? Because he's such a stand-up guy. So we're like, all right, well, we'll, we'll, we'll give you these and then you can buy those, <laughs> right? Find the happy middle. But he brought them back to his office and now his employees, the people working there who all stand up as well, they stand on the soul steps. And so it's, it, and we're selling them very well because it's sort of like a simple message of like, what do you do with them? Well, just stand on them, <laughs> right? Like, it's not like the propulsors and some of my other inventions where you sort of, you have to educate the marketplace on like what the hell they do, <laughs> right? And we're having the testimonials are just ridiculous because they're special. And I like to think, you know, there is a Western anatomical 100% logic in how they work physiologically, biomechanically. It, it makes perfect sense when you look at the anatomy of the human body and the biomechanics. But what led me to it was this crazy, insane, like, okay, you know, Marty, not <laughs> 9.12 gig gigawatts or whatever the hell he's <laughs> you, In full disclosure, you do remind me of Doc Brown a little bit. So, <laughs> right. There, there is that aspect, and I don't hide that. <laughs> but I mean, and first and foremost, I'm going to be ordering myself a pair and as well as a BOSU ball. And I think if you're a box owner out there or you're just someone that stands, I'm a big proponent of efficiency, optimization, et cetera. And, you know, with a newborn, with a company, I get maybe 30 to an hour to work out, but there's so many little things you can be doing throughout the day that might not be training, you know, quote unquote, but certainly standing and developing, like you said, the, the 
neurological components, the strength, all this great stuff. So I would recommend anyone that doesn't have the opportunity to train as much as they'd like, or even if you do, you can always do more, stand at your desk, but stand on soul steps. And that's even, even better. And, and what I would say, yeah, what I would say about that is what change is the only constant. So what you want to do is you'll stand on them, maybe shift your weight a little bit, take your foot off it, put your foot back on it. So what you want to do is you don't want stasis, right? Because the body's going to try to find this um, homeostasis and the mind will too. So you don't want to get stuck in the rut of like, oh, I need to be military rigid here. People will pass out at weddings because they drank too much the night before and they're standing there and all day. Yeah. And then they're standing there and they're like in the wedding. So they're like, oh, I can't even scratch my nose kind of a thing. (laughs) They lock their knees and they pass out. (laughs) Well, for the listeners, WEC method, W-E-C-K method dot com has everything. And I'm going to immediately email you after we get off this to set up another time to chat because I I just want to hear so much more about you. Your products are amazing. But again, we, we scratched the surface of what it means to be an entrepreneur. And I'm fascinated by so much that you've said, and I'm, 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 I'm really grateful to David Newman for connecting us. And this has been truly awesome. So I think box owners need to explore some of these things, things like the BOSU ball, things like the soul step, you have other products on there like a mace and bands and other things that they can be checking out and and diversify what they're doing at the box. Yes, constantly varied functional movements, high intensity, well, course and- distance time is important, but yes. so is a lot of this little stuff that I think CrossFitters at, at some to a fault turn a blind eye to. Well, and what I would say is that, so for CrossFit, I what I love about CrossFit, again, it, in addition to the other things that I stated, is this idea of, I want to have the greatest capacity possible amongst the broadest spectrum of things, right? And so one of them is locomotion, obviously. And I wanna say to the box owners, Sam Dancer has, Sam, Sam Dancer has fallen in love with the invention that I created called propulsors, propulse speed trainers. And they're these little hand weights that are only 12 ounces And what you do with them is you harness the natural jogging motion that is both hand, both hands go down before they pop up. So the natural jogging motion is not to swing them, saw them back and forth. The actual natural jogging motion is to bounce the hands. And this gives you the timing with an audible feedback and the kinesthetic sensation of a jolt of force that you will run up a hill or up a set of stairs easier with them than without them, because there's more return to the connective tissue than the cost of carrying them with the muscles. Okay. And it's a super special thing. And and if you want email or or reach out to Sam dancer to see what he says about them, because they're truly special and locomotion. If you know, you got to get to the fire, right? You, you got to get away from the bear. So that's a big aspect. And I, I think that that's a genuine contribution that the CrossFit community will genuinely appreciate because I would guess that a lot of listeners out there, when the workout of the day is three, four hundreds, maybe that's the day that I got to go to the hardware store and pick up the yeah. whatever. <laughs> that's, the day we, that's the day we skip. You had me at make running easier. So easier, I, easier. And, that's you it. know, and again, over at your site, that's something that's super easy. Affiliate owners, you know, you, you buy 10, 12 pairs of them. They sit in a box when you have running days, you grab them. Right. Yep, and yep, so yep. super, simple. super out of everything you have. I mean, the soul steps, obviously I think are great for personal home, but I think they'd be great to have at the box for, for someone struggling to squat on, to press on for all of that. You know, the BOSU ball, you know, in, in the CrossFit world, storage is, is challenging. So oh, I can God, understand yeah. some of that challenge, but absolutely for, for something like the Propulse, I mean, That'd be the easiest thing you can store. You keep them in a milk crate. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and, exactly. and grab them. I hope you have a frequent shopper uh, thing going on in your site because I'm going to order one of everything. Well, I think um, what I what I can do is um, I'll I'll get you a discount code, and then um, in the show notes, maybe you can give a discount code to all of your listeners. That would be phenomenal. They always appreciate that. Um, we'll put it in the code. We'll post it online. So if if you're listening. 
But by the time you're listening to this, we'll have that for you and it will be all set. But uh, definitely check it out. And again, I'm going to have you back on. Um, I'm going I'm anxious to read your autobiography that I assume you're working on because all crazy people like you are working on an autobiography. Is that true? Well, I started work on it in 2010 and then, I shelved it. and then I shelved it because it was like, you know, and I was just talking to a tape recorder and get that stuff transcribed. And, uh, you know, I still have all the transcriptions, but um, the story is still being written. So yeah. well, I look forward to the chapter on the Range Rover yeah. and, <laughs> and, and some of those party stories from New Jersey. But but man, this is so great. This is the beauty of. I mean, CrossFit, the fitness world, podcast world, you just get to meet awesome people. And like I said, I'm grateful for David Newman. He's been on the show numerous times. The listeners got to know him. Uh, his jump ropes are, are the best things. He's like you always working on the next thing, but yes, but he's this incredible. Is awesome. And he's I hope incredible. that, I hope that we were able to, you know, give the listeners just a little different vantage point. It's not often we get someone that's kind of outside the, the CrossFit world. And I think it's important not to forget just because it's not, you know, quote unquote CrossFit doesn't mean there isn't value in it. So we appreciate it, David. Well, thank you for the opportunity. And, and once again, I take my hat off to the CrossFit community because it, the, the contribution to the fitness industry is, is massive. And it, you know, it, they fill the niche that was necessary. And I think that, you know, if we look at the red blooded Americans who are going to help save the day for generations to come, more than likely that the CrossFit community would tend to be in that camp than outside of that camp. 100%. And my partner, Fern, he missed out because he would be, this would very much turn into a uh, political podcast if he were on. <laughs> I, I like to keep things fitness related, but he's yeah. going to want to hop on next time. And uh, right. you're, you're going to love him. So thanks again for, for your time. Okay, great. So you never miss an episode of the podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and on all major podcasting platforms at best hour of their day. Thank you so much for tuning in and for being a part of the best hour of our day. See you next time.